here to discuss Ryan Johnson's Star Wars The Last Jedi. And uh, we're going to discuss what indie developers can learn from it. Um, I'm going to kind of go through some lessons that the movie kind of tries to teach and how they've applied to me as an indie developer uh, throughout my history in, in developing games. So about me, I'm Josh Fairhurst. I'm the founder of uh, Mighty Rabbit Studios and the co-founder of Limited Run Games. Uh, I started Mighty Rabbit Studios back in 2010 to develop this game called Saturday Morning RPG, uh, which I released on iOS in 2012. I followed that game with Breach and Clear, which was a tactical military strategy game that we built for a client in 2013, I think is when that came out. Uh, it came out on PC in 2014. And then in 2015, we released Breach and Clear Deadline. Let me go back to that so you can actually see it. There we go. Um, and around that same time in 2015, I started Limited Run Games. Limited Run Games is a publisher of physical versions of games that were previously digital only. So we take games that are available as download and we put them on disc or cartridge for collectors and for preservation and a variety of other reasons. Uh, and we sell them direct to consumers. So we work with directly with developers and publishers to get their games out and get them a wider reach and wider audience. Um, and I'll talk more about that later. So why am I talking about Star Wars The Last Jedi? Uh, the, the real frank reason is I needed a way to trick people to come in to listen to a talk about failure. Um, because I did one last year and I just blatantly called it failing forward and I didn't get many people. So uh, I don't think a lot of people like to hear that you're going to fail, but you're going to fail. And in Star Wars The Last Jedi, failure is a central theme. You're going to fail as an indie and how you deal with that failure is going to define you ultimately. So there's a few lessons you can actually learn from this movie that I'll talk about. The first lesson is that it's not going to go the way you think. That's something that Luke says to you uh, Ray early on in the movie uh, and I got the gif of him drinking the milk that everybody doesn't like um, So I, I put that there because when I was developing Saturday morning RPG my team and I had a lot of naive thoughts about how it was going to go uh, The day before it came out I remember a meeting where we all sat down in a room and we discussed what we needed to continue going to continue developing and if I had that meeting on video I really wish I did you'd be able to see how naive we were about how successful that game was going to be. Uh, I think we broke it down to, uh, we all kind of thought it was going to make like $300,000 in launch week, and that it was going to continue to generate enough revenue to allow us to operate at about $40,000 a month in terms of payroll for a year to continue developing it. Uh, when it came out, it actually made $10,000 in release week, and that was uh, before Apple took their cut. And it wasn't a lack of reach, it wasn't anything. We were on press sites, we were in print magazines. Uh, you could go into Walmart and buy a magazine with a cover story on the game. Uh, and it was featured by Apple. It was on the front page of the App Store, it was everywhere. But we did things wrong and we failed pretty hard. And we weren't prepared for it. We all thought it was gonna be massively successful. We thought we were gonna walk away with hundreds of thousands of dollars, that we were going to be able to continue crafting our games until I guess the end of our lives. But it didn't go the way we thought, and we were not prepared for that. And as a result, uh, most of the core staff from that time left. Uh, I was left with uh, about four out of the nine people that were there. Um, my co-founder actually left at that point because uh, he couldn't afford to keep working for nothing, and the $10,000 we had earned on the game was not gonna go anywhere. So one of the things that I recommend to anybody starting off on their indie journey is to not Go forward thinking that it's going to be a success, thinking that you know how it's going to go, because it's never going to go the way you think. You have to prepare for so many different eventualities. You have to prepare to fail. You have to prepare for success. Or you have to prepare to be somewhere in the middle. You need to have plans for all those different paths. Otherwise, you're going to end up like me, and you're going to be caught completely off guard. Um, lesson number two, and I mean this kind of ties in with that, is uh, failure. Failure is a great teacher. You're gonna learn from your failures. It's not a problem to fail. It's only a problem if you don't recognize that you failed and try to learn why you failed and correct that. With Saturday Morning RPG, we went back and looked at how we had failed and what caused that failure. And really, on a hard look, it was pretty clear that we had made some bad decisions in terms of the, the, the model that we had chosen for the, the 
actual app. It was free to play and you could buy future episodes. We had made a terrible stab at episode one because the game was episodic. The first episode was free, and it's actually garbage. Um, I'm willing to admit that right now. The first episode is very non-representative of what the game is. The second episode is so much better, and if we had just kind of shipped with that forward, uh, we would have avoided a little bit of that failure. And that's not entirely everything, but we were willing to take a look at the game and analyze why it was a failure, rather than kind of stubbornly say, it's not me, it's them, they don't understand it, because a lot of indie developers will do that. And that kind of leads me to lesson number three. I'm kind of burning through these, so I'll try to slow down. We've only got five lessons. This quote from the movie I really like, let the past die, kill it if you have to, that's the only way to become what you are meant to be. When we had Saturday Morning RPG fail, we did not give up on it. We continued working on it until this very day. Next week it's coming out on Nintendo Switch because I am delusional and will not give up on trying to make that game into a success. But I'm practical enough to realize that I shouldn't be doing this, that I should be killing it, I should be letting it die, I should be leaving it behind and moving on to other things. And to some degree I acknowledge that and, and had my whole team move on to other projects immediately after Saturday Morning RPG. I kind of held on to it as a uh, passion project at that point. Uh, I kept developing it. Uh, thinking that my time wasn't worth much so I could just keep putting my time in it. But if I go back and kind of look at the opportunity cost, what I could have been doing instead of doing Saturday Morning RPG, you know, I'm hundreds of thousands of dollars in the hole on this game. And the first release indicated the success it was going to have everywhere. Critics were going to like it, but it wasn't going to catch on financially. So since we put it out on iOS, we've also put it out on Kindle Fire, Ouya, GameStick, which nobody's ever heard of, uh, terrible platform, we made like $15 on that. Uh, we put it out on Steam, did alright on Steam, did okay on Steam. Um, PlayStation 4, which uh, facilitated a, a physical release through Limited Run and Vita, and the physical releases were actually kind of the closest things in terms of getting us back to a point where it was profitable, uh, but we're not there yet. Um, and Xbox, and we did a Wii U port that canceled uh, because certification was ridiculous on Wii U. Uh, but we never killed the game. We never let it just completely lie where it was, and that held me back. It didn't allow me to become what I was meant to be, uh, because there's so many other things that I could have been developing at that time. I could have been assisting uh, more heavily with Breach and Clear and made that into a better game, or worked on Breach and Clear Deadline and tried to focus on making that a better game, some of the other stuff that we put out. Uh, but I was so kind of engrossed in this uh, act of trying to revive Saturday Morning RPG from the dead, that was never going to happen. And this isn't exclusive to me. Uh, I started developing indie games back in 2010, so I've kind of seen mobile gaming at its peak. Uh, I saw a lot of developers that had huge, massive hits, and uh, those guys are kind of gone now because one of the things they'll do is uh, they're kind of expecting their follow-up game to echo that success. And that rarely ever happens. You can't count on having a success and then seeing that success spur other successes. It's not always going to be that way. And what will happen is these guys will get hung up on that second game thinking that it was them, not the game itself. Because the first game was a hit, surely this one should have been. And I've watched several companies that I really admire drive themselves out of business because they wouldn't drop that second game. They wouldn't let it die and just move on to something new. And I'm seeing this with a game that my friends have developed that came out on Steam that they're kind of still stuck on. Um, and it's, it's a fun game, it's a good game, but it didn't catch on in the market. And I think they still harbor belief that it could, but I really don't know if it ever will. Um, so I, I feel like they're kind of going down that same path uh, where they're not going to survive because they're going to be focused on this thing that they won't kill. Lesson number four, even when all seems lost, there's still hope. So the movie ends, and, and this may be spoilers, but with a very small amount of the characters left. Uh, the, the, the main group, the Rebellion, is kind of in tatters. There's like a, a handful of them left to fight back a giant empire. And rather than just give up there, they vow to continue to fight. And I think that that's really applicable here, because <coughs> everything seemed lost to us when we failed, but through struggle, we managed to get to our next thing, and we struggled through that. Uh, it was about two years of struggle. We barely worked for anything on Breach and Clear, but we took it because it was paid work and it was enough to keep going. 
Uh, and, and that brought us to breach and clear deadline. Breach and clear deadline had a better budget. And most people were able to get paid decently. Um, not great, but decently. Uh, but then that game came out. And again, it was a huge failure, just like Saturday Morning RPG. So we were meeting our second failure at that point. And that's the point where really all, all hope seemed lost. And I actually had a meeting with every single person at Mighty Rabbit Studios saying, the company's going to be closed in a month. Uh, just prepare, start looking for other jobs. We're going to be out of business. I had everybody sitting around our, our main room in our old office in Cary, and I told them, just get ready. We're going out of business in a month. We had $10,000 left in the bank account. No options left for paid work. Uh, it seemed like everything was dead, and everything was going to go away, and we were never going to be successful. But I had this one opportunity. We had put Breach and Clear out on PlayStation Vita. Our publisher didn't care about PlayStation Vita. They said, take the game, put it out there. We don't care. You can have the revenue from that. Uh, digitally, it had made $10,000, not enough to be worth anything. I mean, the 10000 that were in the bank account was from the digital version of that. Um, and I just took a Hail Mary and decided that I would put that game in a physical form and see if it would catch on with consumers. I would take it, put it on a cartridge, package it up as a boxed product, and sell it direct to PlayStation Vita collectors. And if that was successful, that would save our company. Uh, so I spent all the last money that we had in our bank account, every last dime on that. I uh, took a loan out against my house to fund the development team to let them keep going while we waited for those physical products to arrive. And if they didn't sell, I was going to lose my house, probably end up divorced. Uh, I would probably be in a very sad state right now if it had gone wrong. Uh, but thankfully, through some help from Douglas, who is one of my good friends that helped me with that, we really marketed the game and found an audience and found a niche. And when we put that up to sell, it sold out in 108 minutes. And we were looking at $30,000 to $60,000 in revenue in 108 minutes. And that brought everything back from the dead. Uh, from there, we were able to spawn into working with big companies like Epic and Oddworld on bigger games and doing the same thing, taking their digital games, making them physical, and bringing them out to consumers. And at this point, we're actually hitting about a million dollars to two million dollars a month in revenue. And we went from $10,000 in the bank, everything about to close, uh, worst case scenario possible, me telling people they're not going to have jobs, to insane success in the course of three years. And if I had just given up at the end of Saturday Morning RPG when that came out and that flopped, if I had just given up there, I would never be where I am now. If I had given up after the success or the, the failure of Breach and Clear Deadline, there's no way I'd be where I am now either. Um, everything really seemed like it was lost at that point, but there really was still hope. And I think that everybody still has that hope. You just have to find your way to get there. I think there's success for everybody but there's going to be a lot of failure leading up there. Don't let that failure uh, color your opinion on, on how your future is going to go. Because failure is not going to define your later success. Lesson five, this one's just kind of an easy one to throw in. Um, it's not as poignant as any of the other ones, but it's something that I've seen uh, throughout my career is every time we release a game, we rarely ever meet the expectations of everybody. Uh, you will never have everybody be happy. There's always going to be people who hate you. With limited run games, I get like the most vitriolic stuff spewed at me every time we release a game and somebody misses it. We've gotten expletive laden tweets. We've gotten customer support tickets where somebody called Emily a walnut, which I don't even know what that means. Uh, they they uh, they just hate. There's so much hate out there, and you have to prepare yourself for that hate. And I put that in here for, for The Last Jedi because, I mean, honestly, to me, the movie is perfectly fine, but everybody seems to hate it on the internet. Everybody on the internet seems to hate it for whatever reason. They just, they just hate it. And, and, you know, I don't think it's the greatest movie in the world, but I, I thought it was okay. I thought it was fine. Uh, I don't think that there's any, any reason to say that it destroyed my childhood or any of that stuff. And I feel like the, the director got death threats and all sorts of other crazy things because of his decisions with the movie. Um, and you're going to see that a lot in games. Uh, if you have ever looked at the community for a first-person shooter, if they change the stat of a gun by 0.1, so that it does 0.1 less damage or whatever, which might mean that like it takes uh, a third of a second longer to kill somebody, they'll like explode on Twitter and call the developers like the worst things possible. 
Um, it's absolutely vitriolic out there, and people are going to hate you. So prepare yourself for that, because um, that's, that's a very real thing. Um, and that's, that's pretty much all my lessons um, that I have from that. And I, again, I think I burned through it, but uh, I really thought that they were kind of important lessons for any developers to know and anybody that's hoping to go into any development because you're going to encounter failure. I think so often we obsess on the stories of success. We see games like Undertale and Minecraft. These guys are making millions of dollars on one game or Minecraft billions. And we think that's going to be me. We think that we're going to be that next success. But in reality, you look at Steam, there's thousands of games coming out every week. And almost none of them are making more than $20,000 anymore. I mean, it's like absolutely brutal out there to actually have a success and to actually really get out there. But it's possible if you prepare yourself for it and you understand that more likely than not, you're going to fail. Um, it's just a very important thing to know and understand, and I think a lot of people don't want to understand that. They want to be naive, they want to believe that they are going to be the next big success. Uh, but so often that's not the case. And so many developers I've seen throughout the years have gone out of business. A lot of the people I looked up to in 2012, 2013 are gone because they just never planned for failure. They never expected failure. And I think that's really sad because these were people that I really liked, that I really enjoyed talking to, that I admired, that uh, honestly I was like starstruck to meet back then because I thought, oh wow, they have a, a game on the App Store making a million dollars a month or whatever. But they're all gone now because they never thought that they would fail. They thought that they were bulletproof and that backfired. So everybody just needs to plan for that failure and plan that it could happen. If success happens and you plan for failure, what's it really matter? You're, it's like it's all the better if success happens when you plan for failure. But at least you plan for failure at that point. So that's pretty much what I have to say. Um, that's pretty much my talk that I prepared. But I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. I like answering questions, so ask away. I'm sure. Do you think an episodic release uh, would work and how it? So how would you do it? I think I think it used to work. I think I think back when Telltale started doing it, I think it was novel, it was fresh, and people were willing to stick around for new episodes to come. Uh, but I think more often than not now, people are waiting for episodic games to just release the complete edition. So like they don't even care that it's being like every month you can turn in for a new chunk. They're just waiting for it to all be there so they can binge watch it. So I feel like it's not really the the model to pursue anymore. I, I feel like that it's it's kind of I guess outdated with how much content's on the market. Like people would rather like like get your game played in one burst and move on to the next the next week's hotness or whatever. Um, because previously, when Telltale was releasing the first season of Walking Dead or whatever, there was a lot less on the market. There was a lot less fighting for people's attention. So if they put out uh, episode one and said come back in a month for episode two, people would. But I don't think people are as willing anymore because their attention spans are short and they want to just go back to PUBG or whatever they're playing these days. Oh, I thought you were like No. Um, <laughs> uh, I've been working there for about a year now, and um, so every time we go to conventions, I get to enjoy Josh and Douglas being well-known to everyone, but I would want to know, like, your suggestions for someone starting out, like, because when you used to go to conventions or when you used to be kind of, like, new in the game, what would your suggestions be in order to prepare for failure, but in order to also like make yourself known in the community, like what, like what were the steps that you would take or that you suggest to take if you're new in the game? So if you're new, the most important thing, and this is something that I, I used to talk about a lot in uh, some of my other like my indie success panels that I used to do, um, mm -hmm. networking. You got to network with everybody, meet everybody you can. You never know who's going to be where. If somebody had met me at ECGC in 2010. It would have been like, oh, that's just that guy from NC State or whatever, that NC State student just walking around completely unimportant, like, I don't need his business card, he's never going to be anything. But now, uh, I, I'm significantly more important than I was. I don't want to be like egotistical or anything like that. But, but I have a large network now. And if you had taken the time to meet me and talk to me back then and kind of kept up with me throughout the events that, that kind of preceded that, um, I became a valuable part of people's networks. And there's people that I have met that had good networks, like Randy Greenback is a good friend of mine. He has 
an invaluable network. He's been working in games since 1993, and he's super friendly, and he's an awesome guy. And he'll fight to the death to help you out and make sure you succeed. Uh, the only reason that we were able to find Breach and Clear after Saturday Morning RPG was Randy Greenback. Uh, so it was my network that saved me from that failure. So networking with as many people as you can, regardless of who they are, is incredibly important. And networking with uh, really just like going to events and meeting people, just do it as often as you can, because eventually people are going to know who you are if you just keep at it. Um, that's pretty much what I'd have to say on that. I mean, that's the succinct the way about it is just network because eventually somebody's going to be able to help you out and help you get where you need to. Is that how did you? No, you okay. first and then. Okay, cool. Uh, so how did you get funding and a team for your first game? So we started at an, or an opportune time, not inopportune. Um, I had just finished my senior game project at NC State. Um, this was in May 2010, and there was an incubator starting up in the area called Joystick Labs. They were offering funding to indie developers on concept alone. So they would give you $20,000 solely for a good concept. And the guy who was heading it up at the time, Juan Benito, uh, actually came to my senior showcase and saw the game that we had made and saw that our presentation was good and solid. And I uh, was so impressed that I was able to kind of convince him to invest in me and invest in my team, even though I had kind of uh, another semester left to go to college. Um, and through kind of showing off the game at NC State and, and doing whatever I could to network there, I managed to get into Joystick Labs and get that initial funding that allowed me to start building Saturday Morning RPG. Now, $20,000 sounds like a lot, when you're first starting out, but it's not a lot at all. That's going to buy you like a Mac computer, a couple devices, and maybe pay for like uh, a month of people, maybe, uh, unless you're getting them to work severely under wage or for nothing like I was. Um, but I was also working for nothing, and we were all kind of doing it just for the, the hope that we would build into something bigger. Um, so it really wasn't a lot of money, but it was enough to start the company, and their belief in me was enough to make me believe in myself and believe that I could do it. So um, that was enough to get me on board and started. Um, but Joystick Labs made a lot of kind of uh, bad investments. I mean, you can't predict these things when you're making investments. But uh, some of the people, like one of the guys was actually kind of like a serial con man. Uh, he did a Kickstarter called The Doom that came to Atlantic City. That was a, it was a board game that funded for $150,000, never went to print. Uh, he was also part of Joystick Labs, um, so he um, he was in there. That was one of the investments they made because he didn't actually shoot a game. Uh, there was these two Yale graduates that had gone on to be incredibly successful, but they uh, dissolved their company and then reformed it. So they cut Joystick Labs out of all the money. Um, so there's just a, a bunch of kind of uh, bad investments I think that drove them out, and I think their last investment was back in 2011, but. There's another incubator coming to the area. Uh, they're called like the Incubator NC, I think. Uh, it's headed by Robert Bowling, uh, one of the guys who worked on like Call of Duty, Modern Warfare. Um, I don't actually know what any of their stuff is yet. I've just seen like the page that's just saying like, hey, stay tuned for news. So. And how did you find your team? Were they also? So uh, the the team was people that I had met at Wake Tech. Other people that I had met when I was I dual enrolled at Wake Tech when I was in high school. So this this was back in like 2005, 2006. Um, I met a lot of people there, and they were very passionate about getting into games. So I managed to uh, get one of the people on board to be a co-founder with me, and uh, he did pixel art, I did programming. Uh, he did a little programming too. Um, and then I kind of got other people involved. There was a guy that I had done my student project with at NC State that got on board. There was a guy that I had met like three times at Wake Tech called Chris Cooper who joined on. He was a really nice guy. If you get a chance to meet him, you definitely should. I'm surprised he's not in here. Um, he's, he's awesome. Uh, add him to your professional network on LinkedIn. Um, and, and a few other people. Just built a, built a good team for people that I had worked with in class over the years. All right. So you mentioned for your first game, the Saturday Morning RPG, that you had a lot of marketing for it, a lot of advertising, a lot of like cover stories and all that. In the current market, do you think that's a mistake? Because it seems like a lot of the really big indie successes, like your Undertale or Warframe, they don't they don't have hardly any marketing at all. 
So we didn't do any kind of paid marketing or anything like that. We were getting picked up by press sites. Um, this was still around the time when it felt like press sites mattered. There was no Twitch, so like streamers weren't a thing, and like YouTube influencers were just kind of starting to catch on. This was 2012, so like I think that was kind of like the genesis of like PewDiePie and some of the other people doing Let's Plays. Uh, so that was like marketing in that day and age was still I like I have to say day and age for like six years ago, but uh, it was still very much like focused on like get Kotaku to cover you, get. Get, a, get Touch Arcade to post about you, get in a magazine or whatever. So we were in a bunch of different magazines. We even got into an adult magazine called Nuts in the UK. <laughs> I just managed to get an issue of that that had our, had our game in it. Uh, a follower on Twitter sent it to me, so I was like, finally, I have this in print. Um, <laughs> so we got in all sorts of print magazines, got reviewed on all sorts of websites. Um, I don't think it hurt us. Uh, in this day and age, I mean, if you're going to market your game, you need to target Twitch streamers. Uh, yeah. like, that, that's really, the, the, like, don't even worry about websites. Like, they'll cover you because of Twitch streamers playing it. That's that, that's the follow-up. Like, if you were to redo that now, would you focus more on, like, Twitch content creators or yeah, like, YouTube reviewers? Yeah, the thing is, it's an RPG, so it's really boring to stream. <laughs> really boring to stream. So no streamers would actually bother streaming it. We've had some people do it, but, like, if you look at, like, Twitch stream stats for it, it's probably like less than 100 hours if it's actually bothered to be streamed. Because um, it's just kind of a, a slow burn, and there's nothing emergent about it or whatever, but it definitely seems like the games that, that streamers glom onto are the ones that are more successful. The guys we worked with on Breach and Clear put out Friday the 13th. So after they made Breach and Clear Deadline with us, they rolled into Friday the 13th, and that game has been a massive success because it has emerging gameplay, it streams really well, it's scary, streamers can play and scream while they're playing it, which that's like the big win if you can get streamers to scream. That's kind of the, the go-to thing, I think. Um, but, I mean, I, I think like RPGs, like press coverage is pretty much as far as I can go with it, because like, like it just doesn't stream well. I don't know how we would approach marketing different in this day and age. When you uh, started at the incubator, did you have like a second job for extra funds on the so side? So I, yeah, I was, uh, I was actually selling things on eBay as kind of my extra income. So I would go around and find used media, like used games, used movies, whatever, and just kind of find whatever I could to sell on eBay and, and fund my development. Um, and that worked really well back then because not everybody was checking eBay for values and stuff, but now it's not so much. I think everybody's more savvy in terms of knowing their things are worth money, so I don't know if that's necessarily a valid path anymore. Um, I was a teacher at Wake Tech for about a year and a half, uh, right around the time I was starting Limited Run Games. Uh, I took up a teaching job, because I actually took up the teaching job like the day that I sat everybody down at the office and said, we need to, like, just, we're, we're winding down, we need other work. Uh, so I took the teaching job that day, uh, and then I quit it a year later because Limited Run was so successful. I actually only kept doing it for about six of those months because I felt guilty about leaving them because their, their programming department was kind of, uh, they were having a tough time getting a lot of teachers and if I just kind of left in the middle of the semester it would have been, uh, I think, very disrupting. So I tried to get through my second year there but just got so busy at Limited Run that I couldn't keep doing it. Um, I think it's very valid to approach development while having a second job. I think that that's a perfectly fine way to do it because uh, to build a good company, you have to start with the mindset of paying your employees before you pay yourself, which is what I did. Um, I wasn't paying people much at the start. I think everybody was getting like $400 a month or something, but it was fine because I was getting nothing. So ultimately, when it came down to it, if anybody was unhappy with what they were getting paid, at least I wasn't sitting there getting paid far, far more than them. I wasn't exploiting anybody uh, because I was doing the best I could for everybody on the team. Um, so I would say that, like, if you have money, pay others before yourself, and that's how you build a loyal team. How do you know when to um, drop a project and move on versus trying again? Like trying to bring your game to another platform, or in the case of um, Saturday Morning RPG, where you so I mean, tried we to should have we should have dropped it when it was so far off from our expectations. When we were hoping to get three hundred thousand dollars and it only brought in ten. Uh, we should have accepted that as an indicator that this is how it's going to do on other platforms. Because, I mean, it kind of was. We brought it to other platforms and it never really had massive success. It all just kind of played out the way that it had before. Um, 
the Steam success, the Steam sales were okay. The PlayStation sales were okay. Uh, the Ouya sales were bad, uh, but that was because it was Ouya, and the Game Stick sales were awful. Um, but I mean, everything's just kind of followed this pattern of uh, a little bit of critical praise here and there, and uh, kind of just a lot of financial disappointment. And I think that it was just kind of clear from the numbers that we should have dropped it earlier. Um, so I kind of feel like anytime you feel like if it's in your head that the game should have sold better, if you're there thinking about that and you're thinking, and that's like your, your primary reason of like, oh, I'm gonna do a massive content update that's gonna cost me tens of thousands of dollars to make and that's gonna save the game, that's a bad idea because your massive free content update is gonna play to the 10 people that bought the game and you're just digging yourself deeper into the hole because a massive content update never will generate new players for you uh, unless you have some miracle of being some undiscovered gem that a Twitch streamer picks up and it revives you. But in that case, you can put game development on hold and then if that happens, you pick the game back up. Um, but I think it's pretty clear uh, if you just think about it when you should stop developing a particular So, when you're developing a game uh, for two or three years, you put a lot of effort and sweat and blood and tears into making that game. You put a lot of hours, a lot of everything into it, and if you look at the way digital marketplaces work, eventually your games are going to get lost. Your games on iOS are going to get outdated by some kind of iOS update. Your, your game on Android is going to get outdated because devices in five years aren't going to be able to run it anymore because the OS is going to have changed so much. Um, and on PSN, eventually you know, they're going to shut down PlayStation 4 PSN. Eventually they're going to shut down Xbox Live. Uh, none of these digital platforms are forever. Even Steam at some point will be replaced by somebody else. There's going to be somebody else that comes along and takes that crown. And eventually they're not going to be able to afford the content servers that host your games and they're going to disappear. So from my standpoint, I put so many years uh, into these games that I wanted something that was a lasting monument to what we had put into that game. I wanted some physical preservation of the thing that we had put so much effort into. Whether it was going to fail or not, at least I had this thing that said I did it. And you know, if I was living in a gutter because I lost my house and whatever else, at least I can mutter to people on the side of the road that I made this thing or whatever <laughs> and they'll throw quarters at me into my empty Starbucks cup. Um, so that was kind of the mindset going into it. At least people would know I was there. If I, if I disappeared, at least people would know I was there because you look back at the history of games, people remember horrible NES games. They remember the worst NES games out there because you can still get the worst NES games out there. You can still play them. But how many people remember the worst digital Wii U eShop game. <laughs> who's gonna, who's, well I know, it's the letter, but. <laughs> oh, it's a meme run, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so people do remember it, but I, I don't think that 20 years down the line you're gonna get videos of a YouTuber playing a uh, meme run on their hacked Wii U or whatever. If there was a disc of it, I think they would go back and play it. They would remember that this horrible game existed. So I just kind of wanted a legacy for my game. So it was kind of a selfish thing. And, if, if it worked as a revenue generator, it would save the company. So I looked at it in that, that mindset, like there's a 50-50 chance I'm either going out of business, but at least I have this thing, or it's going to sell all and save the entire business. When it came to like releasing, you had, you had a lot of physical releases for Vita. I know that like your guys' work on releasing things for the Vita kind of helped it stay alive for a little while, like for longer. So, thank you for that. Yeah, the other, the guy behind you is keeping it alive too, right there. <laughs> All right. Yeah, he, he developed uh, Valhalla for the, for the oh, Vita. Nice. So, uh, um, yeah. Did you ever like, did come, I guess when the companies come to you, did you ever like say, hey, maybe we should, we should have it on Vita, or did they already have it there, or something? Did you ever like, were consulted on what? Yeah, so there, there's some developers in specific that we've actually pushed to release Vita versions of their, their games that otherwise wouldn't have been on Vita. Uh, we've got a, a big one coming out soon that uh, we pushed on to Vita, uh, so that's going to be pretty nice when we, we put it out because it's more content for Vita owners um, and it's it's more cool stuff for the platform because I like the platform. It's just 
at this point, it has the power of an iPad 2, so you're not going to find a lot of developers whose games can work on it. Um, at least, like, you're not going to get like a AAA game or, or something like insanely awesome, but it's still perfect for indie games. Uh, a lot of indie developers can still target the platform, so I like it in that regard. Why'd you pick the Vita as a platform? Because like release to Xbox and PlayStation. Our, uh, our client at, uh, at Gun didn't care about Vita. So, so they were just like, you can have it. Because Breach and Clear was their IP. Um, and they told us like, you know, here are the platforms we don't care about. And it was Vita and Wii U. They're like, you can have Vita, you can have Wii U. And so we did a port to Wii U. Uh, couldn't get it through Nintendo certification because their process was doing uh, if you've ever worked in games QA, there's this thing called a soap test where you leave the game on for like 30 hours to see if it does something weird. And Nintendo was doing that in their certification process, and Breach and Clear would crash one out of 10 times if you left it on for 15 hours and then tried to play a mission. And it's like, how do we replicate that in-house and fix it? Couldn't, so we just gave up. Um, then that's really just us being lazy, probably, but uh, we looked at the numbers on Wii U in terms of the people that were still on the platform, and it just didn't make sense to be like, yeah, let me throw $3,000 or $4,000 into this. But on Vita, we, we kind of felt like the, the certification process was smoother for us, at least. We weren't getting like crazy bugs back. We were just getting like silly things like, hey, you're not using the right term for the cross button, which is what the X button is called. Everybody calls it the X button, but it's actually cross. Um, so we, we didn't call it the cross button. I mean, I'd have to change that, but that's like two seconds to fix. There's nothing nebulous there, so we're like, all right, this is the platform we're going to pursue. We released it there, and uh, then I started bugging my account manager about doing a physical release on that platform, uh, and managed to get Sony to drop their minimum order quantity down so we could do it, uh, and the rest is history from there. So it's kind of fortuitous that our uh, our partners didn't care about Vita because it worked out for us. Um, <laughs> They basically told us if we wanted to do Xbox One or PS4, we would need to completely update all of the graphics. And that would have been way more money than we had in the bank in order to pull off. On Vita, they were like, nah, we don't care. We just put it out the way it is, whatever. Did you see? Did you say how many units you had for Vita? Uh, 1,500 copies of that one. Um, subsequent games have been much higher. Our first. Switch release, which we put out three weeks ago, is the Wii Park. We sold 13,500 of those. So it's certainly certainly grown since then. Yeah, I want to thank you, Josh. I think that's a very exciting talk. So I really thank you. I did all that. And I just want to add, it sounds to me like this is actually kind of a favorite thing that you're trying to do here. You know, not just the company has but all these employees who build them differently as the way you do it. So I'm just wondering kind of what are You mean like just trying to get is the information out? How do you or think? is it a different way of thinking? You know, just looking at failure in a different way. How can people look at how the books obviously but really companies don't always think that way, right? Yeah. I mean I try to I just try to talk about it every time I can. I do an ECGC talk every year on failure. Some people who've seen me multiple times probably heard several of these stories like three times at this point. Um, but ECGC is really the only conference, it's, it's local and it's the only conference that lets me talk about failure. I pitch talks to GDC every year, but GDC is far more interested in talking about the, the success, like how successful whatever game was, but when you look at success, how do you replicate success? And if you ask any developer who, why they're successful, if they're honest, they're going to tell you they don't know. They're going to say it was luck, it was right place, right time, whatever, but when somebody talks about failure, uh, you can avoid the same failure if they tell you specifically what they think caused that failure. You can avoid that failure for the most part. Or you can just kind of have a different attitude about failure. Uh, so I like to talk about it and, and he was telling me there's a workshop at GDC on failure and I had heard that from uh, Simon Carlos as well when I complained about not being able to talk about failure. He was like, well you can talk at this workshop but I feel like there needs to be a wider reach for failure at GDC than they allow. They don't give it a very good platform because they're more concerned about having somebody who's a big success up their talk. I might actually be able to now that I'm running limited run and they're familiar with it. They might be like, oh, now this guy's irrelevant because previously they were looking at me and they're like, oh, he has 100 followers on Twitter and his games like have no reach or whatever, so he's not exciting. But um, if I try again, I might be able to talk there. But really my goal is to just anytime I can speak about failure, I do. I try my hardest to. I think it's great, so please keep going. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah.
Any other questions? Or is that it? Got one from Brad. So was this a, when you approached your your employees and said, uh, all right, you know, we've got like one month left, $10,000 in the bank, and I'm thinking about, you know, putting our game on, on Vita, was it a, was it, your decision of telling them what you were going to do? Because you said it was more like a selfish thing, or was it, we're going to do a vote and... I mean, I had a lot of pushback internally, kind of saying, just pay us for the last month and close the door. Um, I, actually, it wasn't a lot. There was like one or two core people that were kind of of the opinion that we should just put the last money into everybody there and then just close the door rather than doing the physical release. But I wanted to not give up and take that gamble on the physical release instead. Um, and I think once I told people I was taking a loan out so they'd still get a paycheck anyways, the, the two people who were against it were, were okay with it at that point because the risk had kind of been shifted from their shoulders to mine. Um, so it was a little bit better at that point. But generally, uh, most of my employees trust my opinion or judgment in terms of what we're doing because I treat all my employees very well. Everybody who's worked with me has gotten a yearly pay raise, sometimes multi-yearly. Uh, I think everybody on the dev side is finally at like area standard pay. Uh, which is great to finally be at. Uh, it seems weird to say that, but um, we went through a long time where we were just getting paid like $400 a month or $1,000 or whatever, but um, I make sure that all my employees are kind of connected with the success of the company and everybody knows that we're kind of only moving up from where we're at now. Um, so I'm gonna, probably through this year, I'm probably gonna be giving people raises quarterly, which is really nice to say. Um, so I think just in general, they trust my guidance or ideas in terms of what to do. Sometimes I suggest really stupid things, but most of the time they don't like end up costing the company money, so it's okay. Sometimes they do. I've done some stupid stuff recently. I, uh, I'm, I'm remaking Sega Saturn cases, and that's really expensive. It might turn out bad, but there's a story on Kotaku about it right now. If you want to go read it, that I'm in. Uh, apparently just got posted before this talk. So, yeah. How much? I mean, just, how much of your business now with, with Women Who Run, and you're making the whole, like the older games or like your own IP? So the right now, my dev side is only about three people, and we're all working on Bard's Tale Four or Wasteland Three for In Exile. So we're kind of like they're they're contractors for another company. They're getting paid a good amount of money, and they're long-term projects, so like two, three years. Um, so it's kind of stable work and it allows me to just kind of focus on limited run instead of having to worry about uh, what they're going to do on the dev side and making sure they're busy. But if Saturday Morning RPG on Switch actually gets itself into profitable territory with Switch, uh, we're actually going to kind of look at doing another original game after that and kind of shifting those people maybe off of work within Exile and onto something original again and taking another stab at it like First original thing we've done in eight years, basically. So it'll be nice, it'll be refreshing to finally get back. And you'll hear that a lot with companies that have been around for a long time. Uh, if they're like kind of contract-based companies, like Vicious Cycle, uh, they were a local company. They uh, they did a talk at Joystick Labs when I was starting out that was kind of my first soul-crushing talk about like how you're gonna fail and how like the industry's not as great as a lot of people will make it seem. That was the best talk I got starting out because I needed a talk like that. Um, but they kind of went over how they would get to do an original IP like maybe once every three years and then they'd have to go back to contract work and dig back out of that hole if it wasn't a success. But they would release something original and then immediately just go back into the cycle of building up a war chest. And we're kind of doing that now. It's only it's taken us eight years to finally build up enough of a war chest to make a budget for an original thing. But uh, we've managed to climb back there, which is nice. Thanks, guys.